Uh, we're going to just answer these as briefly as we can uh, with the recognition that you might want us to elaborate more on the question, uh, their answer rather, that we give. And so, if so just feel free to find one of us afterwards, and we're happy to talk to that with you. Just to be very clear, I'll say this at the outset, um, not a single one of us, nor collectively all of us, have omniscience. So we do not present ourselves as being the know-all, be-all of all things Christianity, but we certainly want to be a help to you and bring your life to bear or your thoughts to bear, your conversations to bear uh, based on the scriptures. So with that in mind, our first up is Ronald. All right, so the first one. So what is the role of fasting in the Christian's life? Is it something we should be doing on a regular basis, that is once a week? that's regular for you. Uh, what is its ultimate purpose? So fasting. Uh, I would say fasting is often tied together with prayer. As we look through the Old Testament and New Testament, you often see the phrase uh, prayer and fasting. Um, it's not always the case. So every time, for example, Jesus prayed, he wasn't also fasting, and yet fasting, uh, I believe, almost every time, is accompanied by a time or a period of prayer. And I would say fasting as well is often in response to or in the midst of a time of mourning, a time of repentance, um, as well as a uh, time of mourning, a time of repentance, and also a time of just deep spiritual need, so seeking the Lord's wisdom. So oftentimes, what does that mean for us today? I would say that uh, fasting is something that we as Christians should do when there is a particular intense uh, time of, of spiritual need, uh, something important going on in our lives. I personally have used it uh, when making big life decisions often or have just or in a time or a season where I'm particularly feeling a deep spiritual need uh, where I just need to almost like a to use a different word, but almost like a cleanse, like, hey, uh, man does not live on bread alone. I'm just going to, I need to refocus. I desire the Lord in this moment more than anything else. And let me just remind, let me beat my body, as it were, as Paul says, in this way to remind myself uh, of my intense need for the Lord. And also as a proclamation to myself, but also to the Lord, hey, this is serious, what it is we're praying about and what it is we're, we're focusing on. So, um, is it necessary and part of the Christian walk? I don't know about once a week, but it should be within the, the, the tool belt, as it were, in the Christian's life, because Jesus himself did it. Uh, it's found in the New Testament. It's, uh, it's found in the Old Testament. It's part of the Christian walk and the Christian life, and, the, and, uh, and there's blessing in it. So I don't know if you guys want to add anything. All right, uh, I've got one that says, can Pastor Chris please explain to us how we should think through worship at Grace Church? I'm thinking about the music, but the other stuff as well. Other stuff is free license for me to talk about whatever I want to talk about. So um, how should we think through worship? I'm assuming this question is talking about worship music as opposed to worship in general. Um, that is one thing that we try to differentiate at Grace Church. A lot of times when people say the word worship, they mean music, which can a lot of times make us by default think that everything else that happens is not uh, during our worship services is not worship. Only the music time is when we're worshiping God. And then everything else is we're listening to scripture, we're praying, we're reading, whatever. Our entire worship service is worship. When we're reading the Bible together, we're worshiping. When we're praying, we're worshiping. When we're hearing from the word, we are worshiping. So how should we think about worship at Grace Church or how would we like you to think through worship at Grace Church? Let's talk about music. Like this evening, when I'm asking you guys, as you're coming into the room, please sit forward. The reason we're asking you to please sit forward, it's not just logistically, hey, make space for the people behind, for the people that are coming in after you. That is part of it. But most of it is we want you guys to be near each other so that you can hear each other's voices. When we're singing together, these songs are picked. Picked? Chosen? Picked isn't, yeah. These songs are chosen specifically because of their lyrical content and their singability. Those are the two kind of pillars that we're using when we're choosing songs. We want them to be singable for you, so we're not gonna sing them crazy high, we're not gonna sing them crazy low, we're not, hopefully, choosing songs that are really hard to follow, and we also want them to be lyrically robust. We want them to only speak truth and solid doctrine. We, w we don't want you to be singing lyrics that you're like, I'm not really sure what that means, but I like the melody. 
Um, so when you are coming into church and you're singing with each other, you're also singing to each other. So don't just think about how you came into the worship service tonight, how you came into the worship service next week. Think about the people next to you. Think about the week that they've been having. How are these words that you are singing to them ministering to their soul and then vice versa? So what you're doing when you're singing, it's not just you enjoying the song or maybe not enjoying the song or maybe you, hit, you put it in neutral when you're like, mm, this song isn't really a banger, I'm not about this one and then you don't sing. But then when we do sing one that you like, then you're like, okay, I'll sing now. That's not why we're here, guys. We're here to sing truth and speak truth to our brothers and sisters so think about singing that way when you're coming in. Um, other stuff, I, I've talked enough. So if you have something more specific, go ahead and write something more specific. Uh, this question is asked, what does it mean to be saved? I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't answer this question um, as a preacher of the gospel. Uh, to be saved is to be saved from your sins, to be saved from the wrath of God, uh, I'm thinking of what Paul says in Romans chapter 5, where he says, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. I'm also thinking about 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, for our sake, he made him to be sin, referring to Jesus, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So to be saved is to be rescued. Uh, to be rescued from yourself, to be rescued from this world, to be rescued from the evil one, to be rescued from the wrath of God being poured out against all unrighteousness, both in this life and in the life to come. Uh, and that being in the ultimate representation in hell. So to be saved is to be saved from that. So thinking of it like this, you are saved when you give your life to Christ from the penalty of sin and from the power of sin. You're not yet saved from the presence of sin. That is still a struggle. That's still a challenge. But in time, specifically when we go to heaven, you'll be saved from that presence of sin as well. When you'll be in unbridled, undistracted fellowship with God. So... That's what we would say when we talk about what does it mean to be saved. All right, so if I know I am in sin but do not feel convicted over the sin, even when others tell me I am living in sin, what do I do? So a heavy question, obviously. Um, I immediately thought of 2 Corinthians 13, 5. It says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves, or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? And part of the, part of the gift that God gives us is not only His Spirit inside of us, convicting us of sin, but He also gives us the fellowship of the saints around us. And so there's, there's two components to that question. Uh, I, I, I know I am in sin, so there's that intellectual aspect, but do not feel convicted over, this, over the sin, and yet others are telling me. So I know it, others are telling me, but I don't feel bad about it. Uh, at that point, I would tread carefully, not to overstate it, but I would be, I'd be praying. Uh, I, let, me, let me think about it in two terms, not as if I were the person, but as if I were your friend in that moment. Uh, brother or sister, reflect well on this, that is a weighty thing for, for me to show you the scriptures and show you your sin. Like, listen, here, here's from the scriptures, the word of God telling you you're in sin in this way. And for you to be like, ah, I don't really care. Or, ah, okay, but whatever, I'm still going to do it my way. That is the epitome of a rebellious heart. That is the heart of sin. And that is not a characteristic of a child of God, right? That's not to say that People who are Christians don't sin. That's, that's not at all. And the, the defining mark of that is that we are broken over our sin over and over, and we go through that cycle of repentance and, and turning back to God, and oh, we messed up again, we go back. But if in that cycle that's broken where it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm hard-hearted, uh, Paul talks about the searing of the conscience in this way, uh, and there seems to be that going on where, hey, 
the Spirit's convicting you, or rather maybe in that moment not necessarily, but it's, cover, it's being covered over by your own desires to live out that, that sinful life. Um, surround yourself with Christians, repent, turn to the Lord in faith, and recognize that whatever it is you're looking for in that sin, it will not satisfy like Jesus Christ satisfies. In Jesus Christ, you have everything you need, abund- exceedingly and abundantly more than what you need, and that sin is, is, is crap compared to Christ. So. Uh, This one has gained quite a few upvotes, so we'll do it. On repentance, how private is my conversation with my elder pastor about specific sin? So there's a a couple things in here. Um, One, I want to be clear, those of us that are coming maybe from Roman Catholic backgrounds and we think we need to go to our priest and confess, um, it doesn't work that way. We confess our sins to God. We confess our sins to God, not our pastors. As far as the privacy of that, your, your private information is not shared um, publicly. Even when we meet as elders, we, we share as much information as we feel is necessary to be shared, just to update on like how people are doing in church because we want to care for you well. But if it's more, if it's more information that's just unnecessary, then we don't share that. Um, the other, I guess the one caveat would be when we're talking about uh, cases of um, church discipline. So church, church discipline, Matthew 18, um, step three is when you would bring whatever's going on in a person's life before the church. You do that in an act of love because stage one, step one, and step two have not worked. You've gone to that person individually. You've gone to that person with several others. Then the next step would be step three, where you take that before the church, again, out of love to make them aware so that the people of the church, the, the members of that church can go to that fellow member They can pray for them, they can be aware, they can um, pursue them with the goal of restoring them to a right relationship. The end. All right. Um, Apparently you guys all want to talk about marijuana. Um, All right. How could I as a Christian address the possibility of undergoing a business venture into the medical cannabis industry? Uh, medical marijuana industry. Um, I will just give you the punchline. Don't do it. Uh, you say, why don't do it? Are you just being old-fashioned? Are you just not keeping up with the times? You're not aware of uh, state policies are changing? I just want to be very clear. Laws have should have um, not no bearing, should not be the determiner on Christian ethics. So just because there's a law that allows something to be done doesn't necessarily mean it should be done. And I think sadly and tragically, a lot of either naive Christians or uh, quite aware Christians but try to hide under the law as justification for their actions are using the state laws to justify what otherwise would be a wrong thing to do. So let me back this up and explain to you what I'm describing now. Marijuana, even by people who are not Christians, as studied in their, you can look it up in the Journal of Neuroscience, you can Google this. Marijuana studies will show you that it affects brain chemistry pervasively and tragically. So the use of medical marijuana to use to be justified as like a, as a pain uh, suppressant or other reasons is often the uh, front that's being used by people to justify an unethical and immoral use of a product that has an irreparable damage on the human brain. It creates very addictive behavior, and it is a depressant. People often try to compare alcohol to marijuana. And again, this is simple science here. It is possible to use alcohol and not be under its influence at its immediate point of consumption. It is not possible to use marijuana and not immediately as a class two drug classification to be able to be not under its influence immediately. It has an addictive effect, it has a damaging effect, and it will indeed affect your actual productivity. So for someone to say, I want to be involved in a business venture because there is like legal opportunity for great existence with financial... You're just basically saying, I love myself more than I love my neighbor, and I'll be willing to profit financially on the demise of my fellow citizens. That's exactly what's going to happen. So 
if you are such an individual or you have a friend who is such an individual, I would say, again, any one of these answers we're giving tonight are very brief. I'd be glad to sit down and have a whole meal with you to talk about this with you. But I say this because some of you are even inclined to want to smoke marijuana, uh, and you're using it recreational. Um, I think you are foolish for doing that, and, uh, and I think it's very common for young people to somehow think that they have the ability to consume such substances and it not come at a consequence to their witness for Christ and their own ability to have their mind and their faculties using for the Lord. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Do not get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Is that Paul telling the Ephesians, Hey, you can get drunk with beer, you can get drunk with liquor, but stay away from wine. That's not all what he's saying. What's the issue there? Well, the context of Ephesians 5 is having a life that's under the authority and submission of the Spirit of God. When you want to have your full mental faculties in operation in submission to the Lord, being able to have your senses correct, your decisions correct, your thought process correct, the last thing you want to do is bring that under the influence of outside substances, which clearly isn't going to be an example when you're using marijuana. So there is my brief answer for you of what I could describe more, but time doesn't permit. All right, let's do one more from each of us, and then we'll wrap it up. So right. pick your favorite here, big boy. Well, I was, <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna honor Philip, who's the only one who put his name up. So way to go, Philip. Way to go, Philip. Sammy, Sammy's got some. Everyone else anonymous. Unbelievable. Yes. All right. <laughs> All right, Philip. What did Jesus mean in John fourteen two when he says, "I go to prepare a place for you"? Is this place already finished? So John 14, 2, I'll read uh, for context just the first few verses here. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that? That I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. So these are Jesus' final words uh, to his disciples before he's going to the cross, he's leaving, and, uh, and he's leaving these words of comfort, of affirmation. So what, what does it mean that, oh, he's going to prepare a place? Is he still doing that? What's, what's going on here? Uh, huge amount of details. Not going, is he like literally building the mansions in heaven? That's, that's, uh, that's a thought. Uh, he's just doing construction work. No, he's, um, what he's trying to do is provide comfort, where he's essentially saying, there will be a, you will see me crucified. You will see me, see me gone for a while. But take heart. I'm coming back for you so that you will be with me. He's giving them strength. He's giving them a promise that they will never be alone, that Christ will, will, will leave for a time, but he will be coming back for them. And so this is a forward-looking promise, a forward-looking hope. That's the heart of what Christ is trying to say. There's a place for you. And later on, Thomas, I think, is also saying, uh, you know, how do we know? Yeah, yeah, verse 5. Ha, Lord, how do we know? We don't know where you're going. How exactly is that going to work? And he's like, I'm coming back for you. You don't need to know. The, the way, the truth, and the life, it's me. That's how you come through it. And, um, and so, so that's, that's the heart, more or less, of what he's saying. It's a word of encouragement that he will be back for them. All right. Question for Chris. What is the process of choosing worship songs do we take artists of the songs into consideration or just confirm lyrics are sound? So choosing worship songs, <laughs> what we're trying to do, uh, usually Monday or Tuesday, I'm trying to look at what is the passage that Eric is preaching on this coming Sunday. Sometimes that is known, sometimes it is unknown. Um, we try to also go through in our worship services, it's not always exactly the same, but we try to go through a gospel progression. So you guys may have seen that Tonight, we read Psalm 89, then we sing a song of adoration, then we sing a song of confession, then Saul prayed for us, um, an assurance of pardon, reminding us that there is forgiveness for our sins. And then we sang before the throne of God above, we sang of our, um, of our great high priest, that is Jesus Christ, that stands as our mediator between us and God. So that's kind of... So adoration, so we're praising God. So those are, those are mostly going to be um, just praising God for who he is, for his character. 
then we're going to move on to confession. So when we're in adoration, we see God. We're responding to his word, how he has revealed himself to us. And then we're responding in song to that. Then in light of who God is, we recognize our sinfulness, how we do not measure up, how we are sinners and in need of a savior. So then we'll, we'll then pivot into a confession. Sometimes that can be a scripture reading, it can be a prayer. This evening it was a song. We want to look at our sin, our sinfulness, and our need for a Savior. But we don't want to leave you there because the Bible doesn't leave us there. The Bible tells us that there's a Savior, there's an answer for our sin. So we confess our sins, recognizing we're sin, sinners. Then we go to, um, what did I say? Confession of sin, assurance of, pardon. assurance of pardon, thank you. Assurance of pardon, that there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness for all of us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Then we go into thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for what God has done in our lives. So that adoration, confession, assurance of pardon, and thanksgiving, we're usually walking through those in one way or another. Again, we'll switch out scripture reading or prayer or videos or songs, but that's kind of the progression that we want to do pretty much every Sunday. What is the original question? Uh, process of choosing worship songs. So we're choosing songs that are hopefully going to go along with some major themes that are, that are going to be preached by Eric in whatever passage we're in, and also kind of hitting those gospel themes as we're walking through. Um, as far as that last part, do we take artists or songs into consideration? Yes. That's a complicated question. It depends on context. It depends on the song, how many people know that this came from Bethel. If a lot of people know it came from Bethel, we're not going to do the song. Um, we don't do Bethel songs as of right now, uh, but it just depends. It depends on what that song is. How do we find songs? Spotify. So just to be clear, in summary, you're not trying to manipulate our emotions to get us to either sing loudly and cheer or cry a lot. Correct. We, we do not manipulate emotions, or at least we try not to, except for Dylan's saxophone. That is pretty oh, yeah. We blame, we blame Dylan for manipulating our emotions. <laughs> yes. That's as close as we get to emotional manipulation. We want you guys to be thinking about the lyrics as you're singing them. You're processing them. Um, so thinking about that. We're, we're not trying to whip you into emotional ecstasy. We want you guys to be thinking and singing together. I, I just cannot emphasize enough the significance of what Christ Day offers Grace Church. Pastorally, you have to understand the significance. I think a lot of people just simply think a church service is basically a bunch of songs with some filler and then the talking guy who might or might not be good. And depending on whether or not you like the talking guy or you like the songs, determines whether or not you come back. And you think largely like a consumer. This man is pastoring, pastoring you very carefully each and every week, most of which is probably unseen, but is very thoughtfully thought out in order to give you like a gospel rhythm of what it means to come before God in Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But then if God is that holy, then the response is, man, I'm that sinful. I need to confess that reality. But if I confess, is there anybody that I can have an advocate with? Jesus Christ, the Son. And if I have an advocate, can I be forgiven? I am forgiven. And how Chris is even choosing selectively songs and scripture reading and people and prayers in such a way. Friends, you have been worshiping the entire time before we get to the preaching of the Word of God. And the preaching of the Word of God is just the instruction that we might continue to excel still more. 